Well, we are fortunate to have with us this morning the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Robert Menendez, Democrat of New Jersey. We're going to talk one on one here before I bring in uh, the rest of the group. Let me ask you, first of all, how surprised you were by this announcement yesterday. I was caught off guard by it, startled or shocked by it. I want to know what your reaction was when you saw those tweets. Yeah, well, equally surprised. We had no idea at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that, that this was taking place. Uh, but then again, this is the most opaque administrations I've ever dealt with in 27 years of dealing with foreign policy in the House and the Senate. Um, but this is another example of uh, the Trump diplomacy, which is high wire personal diplomacy, not the strategic, thoughtful effort to get to a goal. And you have to wonder in the first place when you were only largely talking to the Taliban and not the Afghan government, mm -hmm. how you expect it at the end of the day to have a success. And uh, look, you know, normally the withdrawals, which we all want to see. We want to see our people come back home. But we have to have them come back home in a way that ensures that the security situation for our nation at the end of the day is preserved after so many lives and national treasure. And you normally uh, have withdrawals in response to a peace agreement that has been bought together, not as a prelude to the possibility of a peace agreement. Uh, you have balked, you have expressed your dissatisfaction with other elements of this high wire diplomacy, summits that the president has with Kim Jong-un uh, in particular. Is this a no-go for you? He's now floated this as something that could have happened, I suppose. Um, is it something that you're against in principle, him sitting down with leaders of the Taliban? Well, look, you know, uh, like his uh, meetings with Kim Jong-un, it's the preparation that is necessary to get there. It's the preparation with the Afghan government. They have an election coming up in a relatively short order. At the end of the day, have you prepared to bring us to that moment? La the fact is that, yes, the Taliban harbored uh, bin Laden, uh, the perpetrator of September 11th, on, as we approach this 18th anniversary. We don't forget that. But we need to find a pathway forward. Forward that includes the Taliban, but it has to be the Taliban and the Afghan government, not just talking to the Taliban. That's only half of the equation. Salmi Khalilzad has been doing that. He's the special representative on Afghanistan. He's met with the Taliban in Doha, I think, for nine rounds of, of talks. Um, how much information do you have about those conversations? Do you support them knowing what you know about the content? Of those conversations? We, well, we, we should know. You know, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is in charge with dealing from the congressional perspective on both uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the House Foreign Relations Committee about U.S. foreign policy. And at the end of the day, we cannot get information from this administration. We've had one uh, classified briefing by Ambassador Kalazad months ago have heard nothing in between. And so you need congressional support and buy-in if, in fact, we agree with the ultimate result. And the result we want is, yes, to bring our people home, but we don't want to have another redo of Iraq where we left uh, without the right conditions and then had to go back. Uh, and so uh, at the end of the day, this is about securing the United States and never having a, a situation where you can have a haven for another September 11th attack. Uh, whatever your political beliefs, that that five-month interregnum, I would think, would startle a lot of people. Uh, that, that they would want the Committee on Foreign Relations to be briefed on the content of these negotiations. What can you do, uh, now that we know that this summit was scheduled according to the President, to get more information on it? Are you calling for a briefing from the administration? What are we going to see here in these uh, We have been habitually calling for briefings from the administration on this topic, on North Korea, on Iran, uh, but we have, it has not been forthcoming. And so sometimes what I do as a ranking member is, you know, whether it's using the few tools that I have, whether it's about a nomination that's before the committee, you know, prolonging that process so we get the administration to react, or whether it's about arms sales, as we did in the Saudi Arabia, uh, the situation in Saudi Arabia, there are limited tools that we have in the minority. Those tools that we have, we're using to get basic information, but we shouldn't have to be using these tools in order to get the, the basic information necessary to make good judgments on foreign policy and national security of the United States. There is the opacity of the diplomacy, and then there's the ignorance of history as well. If we could put up these tweets once again, I'm drawn to the third one in which he asks, how many more decades are they willing to fight? Uh, he seems unaware of the difficulties of dealing with the Taliban, uh, of the wars that we and others have fought against the Taliban uh, in history. Speak to how problematical that is going forward. Well, look, this is a president who, who is not only not steeped uh, in any historical perspective. 
he doesn't seem to do uh, a lot of in-depth uh, work to understand the nature of who he's dealing with, whether that's Kim Jong-un, whether that's China, who thinks in decades, if you're going to have a trade war with them, understand that they think of decades, they will endure pain in order to get to their ultimate goal, something that we find ourselves um, more difficult to acquire. We're more into instant gratification. Uh, and in the case of the Taliban, you know, uh, they will they will fight to, to the death uh, at the end of the day. So you, if you don't know the circumstances of your adversary and who you're dealing with in depth, then you cannot strategize as to ultimately how do you achieve success in terms of your ultimate foreign policy goals. And the president uh, is incapable of that. He believes that these high wire personal diplomacy can charm everybody, can make everybody, you know, the art of the deal. Well, the art of creating a diplomatic peace is much more difficult than his art of the deal. A couple more issues I want to talk to you about. Uh, the first is impeachment. We know that the House committee is going to vote on the path forward this week, debate and then vote on the path forward. How closely are you watching that? I think there's a lot of interest or speculation into how the Senate is watching what's, in, what's unfolding in the House. Well, David, you know the Senate acts if there was ever impeachment as the trier of fact, as a jury in essence. So I, I take that uh, position very seriously, should it ever come. Uh, but obviously, uh, this administration has stonewalled every single legitimate claim by the majority in the House of Representatives for oversight. I remember when uh, they were pursuing, they were in the majority, and they were pursuing everything. Fast and Furious, Benghazi, when, uh, you know, there were unlimited number of investigations. They would never tolerate what is going on now in the simple uh, providing of basic information for the Congress to make decisions, both on policy and in this case whether high crimes or misdemeanors have been committed. And so uh, I think that the House is right to try to get a, a greater access to information so that they can make those judgments because this administration has told everybody just say no, no, no. And uh, you know the courts is, is one avenue but at the end of the day that takes an extraordinary period of time. He's running out the clock as he proceeds to an election next year. Uh, the, the work period is coming to an end. You're going to return to Washington, and there has been a lot of talk across the country about gun policy. Um, there are many who are optimistic that something will be done. There are those who have been through this cycle over and over and over again and think we're going to hit the same wall that we've hit time and time again. What's your counsel to them, your, 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 your words to them about how this time might be different? Well, look, uh, I don't know uh, how many more uh, mass shootings have to be in the hands of Senator McConnell before he ultimately gives us a vote. I do not accept this proposition that I have to, that he says, I have to see what the president's willing to sign. That's not the way the founders of the country created the checks and balances between the Congress and the executive branch. Uh, the Senate should vote on the common sense uh, gun safety legislation that the House has already passed, universal background check. Uh, that would have stopped the shooter from Odessa had been in place because he failed to get it to when he had to go to a background check at a uh, gun, at, at a um, place in which you legitimately buy at a store, but he then had a private purchase. That private purchase would have been subject to a universal background check. Uh, my legislation uh, to eliminate high capacity magazines. You don't need 50 or 100 rounds to go hunting. High capacity magazines are about high capacity killing. These are two common sense gun safety legislation uh, that I think every American uh, overwhelmingly supports. Uh, you just saw a recent Quinnipiac poll, 72% said the Congress should do more. 90 something percent said universal background checks should be pursued. Uh, even the assault weapons ban, which sometimes is the most controversial, had a 60% approval rating, nearly 90% on red flag laws. So the American people are saying they want to see something done, the president and Republicans, to their peril, ultimately uh, can stonewall it. But more importantly, there are lives to be saved, and we can save lives through some of these common sense gun safety legislation. Last question here about the Senate. I've heard more and more people talking about how the Senate was the world's greatest deliberative body. Uh, in a few minutes, Steve Bullock, the governor of Montana, is going to join me. He says he's had no interest in running for the Senate. What's your message to him and, and others uh, who have no optimism about the Senate being able to do anything in this day and age? Why is it a place where one should train his sights uh, to go and serve? 
I think it's still one of the most important institutions in our country. It is a critical check and balance against any administration, this one or any other. The confirmation of judges, the confirmation of nominees, all creates a process by which you can have a check and balance and making sure that the government operates as it should on behalf of the American people.